You're watching EVH Gear TV, brought to you by Mike's Music. Visit Mike's Music online for all your EVH and other gear needs. Microphones for EVH Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones, and official Van Halen merchandise is provided by VanHalenStore.com. Now, here's your host from Ontario, Canada, EVH Gear artist Eric Broadbent. Hey everyone, it is the weekend. Happy Friday to you all. Welcome to EVH Care TV Live. I'm joined tonight with a very, very special guest. And this is this list of credits could actually take the whole 90 minutes, so I'll try to keep it concise. <laughs> We've got a uh, world-renowned and sought-after photographer. We have great musician, um, the uh, author of many uh, published books, an incredible musician, and the master of mac and cheese. Mr. Scott Kelby. <laughs> How you doing, Scott? Hey Eric, what's up? It's good, <laughs> it's good to have you, buddy. It's great to be here, man. I'm very excited. I'm excited about this, too, because we're going to take a little different approach. And it'd be almost like having Eddie Van Halen on the show and not ask him some guitar questions. We'd have to do that. But we're going to go, we're going to take the same approach with you. We're going to take a little bit of photography towards the end, but we're going to open up, you know, a little bit of a curtain to show a different side of the Scott Kelby that most people don't get to see. Cool. I think we're going to have fun I with it. Everybody asks me about photography stuff all the time so I know. i'm happy to be talking something i love as much as guitars yeah exactly so we're going to get right into it and folks over in the chat i'm going to do my best to uh, jump over and say hi to you as much as i can but we have a lot of questions uh, on the program tonight if you have a super good question for scott kelby tag me in the chat at evh gear tv and that way it'll highlight and i'll see it it's a little easier to see those ones as opposed to the regular ones. so i'll try to funnel that off to scott but scott let's jump right into your background as a musician and i i just realized the other day uh, an additional instrument that you play I didn't know about, but you started off on drums. Is that correct? And when did you get into that? Yeah, I started drums in uh, at the very end of elementary school uh, was when I got my, my first kit. And uh, I would say that I got my first like quality kit uh, when I was in ninth grade. So the back then that was the end of middle school. Now it's part of high school, but it was the end of middle school. I got my first Slingerland kit. And why did I want a Slingerland kit? Because my idol at the time, Danny Serafin from Chicago, right? That was, you know, yep. I was in jazz, you know, in high school, I was like in the jazz band. So we, we had to like jazzy drummers, but I grew out of that quickly, <laughs> but, but he was at the time like, oh, I love Danny Serafin. You know, I was, I say I was in ninth grade, but he actually is quite a good drummer, but, uh, I got a Slingerland kit and that was it. I'll, I'll never forget my entire life. The day I got it, it was like. I would tell you the story, but I'd be in tears, but it was like one of the greatest days of my entire life. I didn't expect to get it that day, and my dad pulled into a music store, just like, we're here to get you drums. I about blacked out. Uh, wicked. So that's a decent <laughs> kit to start on, for sure. I mean, it's not like, you know, those things you buy at the department stores with the paper heads and all that kind of stuff. I did have that first. Okay, yeah. And then, and then I had a set of drums called Stuart drums, okay. which were like the, the cruddy set you buy. But the Slingerlands was my third set, and it was like the real thing. But that was the first time I felt like this is a real set of drums. I had Zildjian cymbals. Yeah. You know, because I did, I had like Bob cymbals in my second set. It was like there wasn't a name you would recognize, like Alex's cymbals. You're like, <laughs> who's that? Exactly. Yeah, it's like random name. <laughs> it is nice when you finally get into some good gear, and that's what's nice about today. Now, this isn't something we had on the uh, the itinerary for tonight, but today with uh, manufacturing overseas and things like that as well, you can afford uh, drums as well, uh, you know, guitars, all that kind of stuff. It's so affordable for kids now to get into it and their parents to invest even 500 bucks and to walk away with a guitar and an amplifier that's good quality. It's a little easier for our, our oh, yeah. generation. <laughs> Different back then. Oh yeah, when I when I think back, yeah, because I mean, back back when you know when I was a kid and stuff, there was there was a handful of amps, and they were all expensive. Mm -hmm. And like I've got a little tube amp, I've got a a, a Black Star HT one, just a little tiny baby one. It's like two hundred bucks. Yep. It's like it's a tube amp, you know. It's I like, know. And it sits on my desk. It's like this big, you know. I was like, well, it's, it's about about a foot. Yep. But it's like. Wow, it's like, you know, so inexpensive and it's just uh it's a whole different time, you know, compared to when I was a kid where you basically had to buy a Fender Twin Reverb. <laughs> that was just like everybody has to buy a Fender Twin Reverb. That's it. That's all we got. Yeah, I know. It, it, <laughs> it's, it's totally like, different. How much is it? It's like 
tremendously expensive. I know. And your parents would say, uh, I'm not getting that. And they go get you something at a yard sale or a pawn shop or something. And that's what I always say to two people too, starting off on guitar for the first time. You start off on a guitar with, you know, action that's this high off the neck and it hurts your hands, cut your fingers. You need a tetanus shot. Um, and you give up because it hurts. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think, especially on an acoustic guitar, you could get some action on acoustic guitar. You could drive a truck through. Exactly. And it does. It. Your fingers are hurting so badly. You're like, well, I can't play for the next three days. And then you don't ever go back. No, that's right. Because once it, once it it kind of relating it to work, kids will say, you know, I don't want to work. I want to have fun. And that's where they, they go. Why? When I worked in retail for many years in music stores, I would always tell the parents, you know, and there's nothing wrong with the parents. The parents just didn't know. They would come in. They didn't know what the investment was. And they'd say, I want to buy a guitar and an amplifier for my son or daughter. And I'd, uh, I'd say, well, how much are you looking to spend? They'd say, well, 100 bucks, 150 bucks. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I wouldn't laugh at them, but I would say, well, look, let's, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you what a hundred dollars will get you. And I'd show them a guitar that was broken or, you know, really, really poor quality. I'll say, you know, look, here's what 250 to $300 will get you. I, and here's what $5,000 will get you. I don't want to sell you the $5,000 package. You, you, you're not ready for that, but get into something that's 300 bucks. They'll take that home. They'll enjoy it. Their kid will enjoy it. I said, bring it back to me in a year and I'll give you 45, 55% of what you paid for it to trade up to the next model. And at least we're starting on something good and there's room to grow and I'm not, you know, breaking the bank for the parents. Right. Yeah. Hey, you know, my first job was uh, assistant manager of a music store. Very cool. We have that in common. That's pretty cool. Where, where was this at? Yeah. This was in Lakeland, Florida. Okay. And, uh, and what was nice was, the, so Lakeland is, is kind of in between Tampa and Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's this town in between. Well, at that time when I was growing up, we had a great civic center. Like we weren't big enough to have a civic center, but they came in and they built this huge civic center and every band came in and we were literally like the only music store in town. Nice. So we, I'd, I'd be sitting there working and would, and the Doobie brothers would walk in the door or Frampton's band would walk in and they were just like, we just need some sticks and strings and whatever. And we'd be like, sure you go here. <laughs> you're, you know, oh, it was, it was awesome. It was, that was a lot of fun. And we got invited to some parties and we met some people we never would have met any other way. But uh, that was kind of cool because Lakeland really at that time, and we had, there was nothing to do, by the way, in Lakeland, Florida, zero. So all we did was just wait for the next week's concerts. And you know how much concerts were to see back then? I'm gonna say I mean, literally five I, bucks to ten bucks. Yeah, five dollars and ninety-five cents was what a ticket was to a concert. Yeah, and I saw everybody. I saw everybody from like Leonard Skinner to Aerosmith to ELO. Uh, everybody came through, and and we all just went. And I went to bands um, that I'd never heard of before. Um, all my friends wanted me to go to this band, and I thought this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. We're gonna go see this band that dresses up in makeup, and I'm like. I'm only going because you guys are going. I don't, I don't not even want to go. This just sounds so stupid. And that was like literally 1976 or 77. And try to do that today. And then Lizzie opened. Yeah. Then what? Lizzie opened for him. No way. Yeah. Yeah. The boys are back in town was like brand new. Oh man. That's how old I am. I'm so old. The boys in back in town were new, and I was able to drive a. I was able to drive a car, and it was new. That's how old I am. The boys, the boys hadn't even left, let alone come back yet. Yeah, their their boys are just leaving. I think was their first hit. <laughs> I love it, but I imagine that today. Try to attend other concerts today that you would have attended back then, and try to finance that for the average person. Oh yeah, it was so cheap, and I was a kid. I like you didn't need any money to go. So and and you you would buy a concert T shirt for five bucks. Exactly. Yeah. Buy a tour shirt. It's like oh man, I had, I had tour posters, and then my whole room was tour posters. I imagine back in that day, you could probably go there with thirty bucks in your pocket. That would pay for your ticket, pay for a shirt, pay, uh, probably a couple hot dogs and a pop, or you're, if you're going with your parents, your dad have a beer or something like that. You know what I mean? And still come home and have and some you'd money. Bring yeah, fifteen bucks home. I know. You know, fifteen bucks when you got home. It was crazy. I love that time, but you know, you don't realize how how awesome it was. You know, you're you're just like this is what it cost. Okay, six bucks to yep. go to the concert. You weren't like this is a great deal. It was just like yeah, it's six bucks. Two months ago, that's went what to, concerts cost. I know. Two months ago, I went to Toronto with a boy, and I paid thirty bucks for parking. Thirty bucks for parking. Yeah, yeah, that's a hard I one. I went to saw Mariah Carey uh, a couple of weeks ago in Vegas, and the tickets were like, what? Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. You're like, this is this is a this is like a whole weekend with Mariah Carey. It's a it's a meet and greet, everything, right? No, no, it's just uh, bowl seats. <laughs> 
Just seats. Yeah. No meet and greet. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. That's insane. Let's jump over to where you moved over after from drums because, see, I thought you went to guitar first because as I followed you online, getting to see some of this, you know, a few musical things that you had shared, I thought you were on guitar. And I think your wife had pointed out that, no, you started on drums first. When did you move to guitar? So I had keyboards in between. Oh, okay. Let's let's go into so, keyboards then. All right. So I was uh, I was a drummer and I was in high school. And uh, I had one of my classes was assistant uh, to the band director. So for one period, I basically, I took role and I had nothing else to do. So I used a practice room. Well, the practice room was, I made it into my office. It had nothing in it. It was just acoustic panels and a piano. And so I literally started playing just, I, I would play a bouncy C, you know, boom, ba, dum, da, dum, da, and tell jokes. And then one day somebody says, I didn't know you played piano and they're like, that's so cool. And I'm like, I don't really play piano. I'm just doing this thing. But they were like, no, no, you're playing. That's cool. And then I was like, well, gosh, maybe I should learn. So, you know, there were other people in in the band program that knew how to play. And so I had nothing to do for an hour every single day. So people would come in, I'd make them teach me songs. And by the time I was uh, leaving high school, uh, here's what happened. So uh, we couldn't find a keyboard player for our band. Now, I had two keyboards. I had a Fender Rhodes, uh, which is an awesome, awesome course, keyboard classic. I had a Fender Rhodes, and I had a, it was a weird synthesizer. It wasn't like a Moog or something, but I had a, a weird synthesizer that I got a good deal on. And uh, I had it there, and we kept getting keyboard players that would come, and they'd play with our band, and they would leave. Like they go, yeah, I really can't do this and all. So one day my buddy who was like my, we were like arch enemy drummers. You know, mm-hmm. you always grow up with another drummer who you're always fighting for all the positions and stuff. That's right. So we come there and, and I tell the guys, Hey, uh, is it okay if this guy sits in on drums? I'm going to go, I'll play keyboards on this song. At which point all of the band laughs. They're just laughing at me and all. And we were doing the song hot legs by, uh, Rod Stewart. Good t- good well, I, I knew the honky tonk kind of piano parts and all. And I, I went over there at the keyboard and they're all like, oh, God, this is going to be so bad. But I knew I'm like, I can play this, you know, and we played the song and the band just looked at me. It was dead silence when we were done. And they go. Oh, my God, you're a new keyboard player. <laughs> I'm like, that's it. That was the last time I, I, I ever played drums. Wow. That was it. I was a keyboard player from that point on. And I made my living as a keyboard player for probably the next 12 years. And so I played all around here. I wound up going to uh, Europe uh, and playing over there. Then I came back and played, you know, kind of up north in some of the, you know, it was a cover band, right? So we were doing, at the time, we were doing disco and funk because, you know, that, I was the only one that liked rock in the band and mm-hmm. everybody else was kind of like, oh, you're the outsider that likes rock because they were very, like like the bass player played his bass way up here. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. serious funk. Yep. I mean, they were like funk, funk, funk. Mm-hmm. And they were good. They were great musicians. But, you know, and I was the youngest one. They're all like 28, 29. I'm like literally 19 years old. But uh, that was it. I never played drums again. Now, I play drums now. Yeah. <laughs> Because I I was actually a really good drummer. I, 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 I'm not trying to pat myself on the no, back, I but I mean. could really play. But um, anyway, so then I became a keyboard player and and, uh, and did that for many, many years. Uh, and then and then I kind of picked up guitar while playing keyboards. Like there'd be songs where it was like, oh, man, it'd be great if there was a rhythm guitar part there. And I'm like, well, you know, oh, the chord's hard. Maybe you could teach me. And then I finally bought a guitar, bought an amp for my house and just started learning. And then I went through a phase where for maybe for three or four years I was maybe 50 50 rhythm guitar and keyboards I just turned my keyboards to the side mm-hmm. so I could play and then reach over and play a you know a line or something and so I did that for a long time uh, and then so then in my last incarnation of my band so I put this band together like today in this modern age yeah with guys that I played with 25 years ago okay same drummer same lead guitar player like same ever same female vocalist all the same uh but then i i we would play whole sets and stuff and i would just play you know guitar the whole time so uh it's it's been something i've kind of you know always kind of i don't say always but for 25 years just played you know here and there as 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 necessary but i really just i love guitar it's like it's my favorite thing to play nice and unfortunately i'm a really good drummer and a professional level keyboard player the thing i'm not that is good that i want to be is guitar but uh that's the one thing where i feel like 
I, I just love it so much. It's just so much fun. You know, it's sometimes the thing that you love the most is the one you need the most work on. And that's me. But uh, I, I love it. I have so much fun. I collect guitars. I still get to play out. Uh, I just got to play over in, in at BB King's. Nice. BB uh, uh, King's Bar and Grill in Orlando. I've got to play at the Hard Rock uh, in Vegas. I, I've had a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, it's just, I just love it. I just, it's just the most fun thing. And I love, I love all the stuff. I love the amps. <laughs> I, I love the guitars, gear, all the pedals. I love all the gear. I love the pedals. I built my pedal board last couple of years and yeah, I love all just, I love all the gadgetry and stuff. And I love the freedom that guitar gives you, you know, it's like, think of this way. My whole career, I was either behind a drum set or behind a set of keyboards and I got a wireless rig and I can go anywhere and it's just the freedom it gives. And it's just after someone who sat there like this or sat there like this, all of a sudden the whole stage is open and it's just, I absolutely love it. It's all yours. Well, the thing is too, I mean, you don't have to be the most proficient at guitar. I mean, you're, you're really good at drums. You're good at keyboards as well. As long as you're having fun. And I mean, you hold your own on guitar. I've seen some of your stuff. So you hold your own for sure. You don't have to be the Eddie Van Halen's and all that kind of stuff. As long as you're having fun, you have the luxury to be able to buy the guitars now that you want, have a beautiful collection, and you're not just one of those guys who buys them and hangs them. You play them, and we'll get into your collection later on in the evening as well, too, which I'm really looking forward to showing a little bit of a gallery. You've got some very cool stuff. But something um, I wanted to make a note of, I was re-watching an interview last night with you. I was showing the boy because I wanted him to kind of get in your world and catch up to who Scott Kelby is. And um, I have to tell people, too, how I basically become to know you was through Jared Poland, one of your mutual, one of our mutual friends. As far, well, I'm not a friend of his, yeah. but it's a follower. And I owe Jared a, a lot because he got me into photography and, you know, was kind of a, uh, a mentor, even though he didn't know he was. And he interviewed you one time at your office, and then I saw this guitar wall yep. and stuff like that. And in that interview, you were saying to him that, you know, through all your years of um, uh, going through the bands, you were always kind of the guy that kind of just naturally became the leader, and you always took it serious like a business. And a lot of guys weren't necessarily, you know, up to speed. They'd rather be out with the girlfriends or partying or maybe somebody got arrested, you know, and then a the gig's canceled. So I really applauded you for being that guy that always took it serious. And, you know, even though music is fun, you do have to take it serious. Um, to get ahead in life as well. Oh yeah, like if you want to pay your rent, you know, it's like you and and in these cases, you know, it's and this happens a lot, not just in music but in art in general. You know, you you have a love for this thing and you have a talent for it or whatever, but making money at it, you know, it's like, well, I'll just give you an example. Let's look at martial artists, mm -hmm. right? So so how does a martial artist wind up with a school? Well, they go to a school, they study. They learn, they become a black belt, they become a second degree black belt, third degree black belt, then they go off and they open their own school. Well, no one, all they learned all the way was how to be a really good martial artist. They never learned the business side of it. And musicians are exactly the same way. We learn how to play our guitars, we learn how to do all these different things, we learn how to play every song, we learn how to improvise, all, but we never learn how to go, wait a minute, I gotta deal with a club owner, I've gotta pay taxes, I've gotta do withholding, I've gotta give 1099s, I gotta do all this stuff to actually stay in business. I gotta find us a job next week and the week after that and the week, and it's just, oh, it's it was a lot of work. And uh, and also, and you know another thing I struggled with? Getting the band to give me 10 bucks a, a week extra for yeah, running for your the work. band. Why, and that's nothing. Yeah. I couldn't get 10 bucks a week to save my soul. They Because uh, every band that agreed it was okay to do it, after a while, they'd all call me into a meeting and go, so what are we getting for our 10 bucks? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Continuous work. I, I spent two I spent ten, two solid days uh, sitting with the, with the agent, calling every agent on my own phone, on my own. This is back when calls cost money. Oh, I know. When you made a phone call yep. and you got a bill for it, it's like, what? Mm -hmm. And I would be calling agents and just doing all and trying calling club owners and doing stuff and trying to rent equipment and just it was it was like a full time job within a full time job. And I couldn't get 10 bucks a month. It's like they'd be like, oh, well, I don't know if we really want to spend that. And I'm like, you know what? You want to you take it all? And they no, nobody wants to do it. Of course. But One they time pay it. they did. One time again, one time a guy did, and the first thing he said was, well, about two weeks later, I'm going through money like you can't believe. Exactly. It wasn't 10 bucks a month because I want to say I'm the leader and I deserve it. You know, when you when you run a business, you get expenses you never dreamed of. 
That's right. driving everywhere and you know and just even paying for gas and all this stuff it was that was a frustrating thing about being a leader uh, i enjoyed it because i could i had a good rapport with the club owners and i understood what our place was what we were doing in the club that night what we were supposed to achieve as a band you know i knew i knew like what everybody's role was for this to be a success i understood how important it was to go out and talk to the crowd i'd have guys that would just go get a beer and sit in the corner in the dark corner i'm like you're not helping anybody sitting in the corner by That's yourself right. with a beer. Nope. This is a business. Network. You're at work. That's right. <laughs> yep. Right. Shaking hands. You and... come back on Friday. You better meet them on Tuesday. That's right. There's... And, and I saw people all all spectrums, some really good at it, that were just amazing. They could fill the club by Saturday night. We had a girl singer, and, and I she was the best I've ever seen in my life. If she met you on Tuesday, she remembers your name. She remembers your your husband's name or your wife's name, your kid's name. And she remembered where you worked and everything. When you came back in the club on Saturday night, she'd see you and go, oh, Bobby Joe, oh my gosh, you're here. How's your kid? Is he okay? What about the dog? And I'd be like, those people would come back five nights the next week. <laughs> yeah, they feel a personal it's connection. A gift, that being that able to do that. Photographic memory. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. And it does it does take a special talent to do that. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of things, too, that you didn't even say that were in a huge cost. Photograph, or I mean, photocopying posters and all those, you know, things that you, I mean, the band, the bands never appreciate it. They like to get the work, but they don't appreciate it. I've been down the same road before, too. Yeah. And it's what it is a very <laughs> thankless job. And you're not doing it to be the hero. You're just doing it because maybe at that time you had the best strengths of everybody in the band. Same thing with me when I was in the band. I was a guy who was always the multimedia guy. When, when websites started to pop up, oh, okay, well, I can build the band's websites and do all the merch and all that kind of stuff. And then when it comes to you're selling stuff and you say, okay, well, I'm going to take a certain, well, it was always agreed upon beforehand. Okay, I'm going to take X amount of a percent above to recoup my, my investments in this and stuff like that. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And it's like, all right. So a lot of times I would just say, forget it because I didn't want to have a fight. But at the same time, you go home like, you know, I'm now I'm out. This, this gig cost me $100 tonight to go play a gig. You know what I mean? And that's when it takes a toll yeah. on your finances, your family, and then, you know, your love of what you do. Do you know that that's how I got into all of this? That's how I have the job that I do today as running this organization and author and all. Mm -hmm. I, I was literally, I'm driving down the road and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I go to uh, PIP Printing. I don't know if they're even around anymore, but don't know Printing. And, and well, we used to do a newsletter for our band. Okay. So we had a mailing list that you could get on that we, you know, manually entered and we would send people, here's our next four cities we're going to. Well, I go to PIP printing and I asked to make a change and they said, oh, well, the woman that does our desktop publishing isn't here. So we can't make this change to your newsletter. Oh, geez. And I'm like, what's, what's desktop publishing? And they <laughs> said, oh, well, there's a Macintosh computer Cork and Express. a scanner and she does all this on, right. And they were, I'm like, wow. So I didn't think anything of it. I left literally two days later, I'm driving down the highway and I see a sign on the side of the road, do it yourself, desktop publishing. Uh, and so I literally just pulled in, I'm coming home from work. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I had a regular day gig. I, I pull mm -hmm. in, I walk into the door and there's a desk and some computers. And I said, I heard the term desktop publishing at a printer the other week. What is it? And the guy goes, oh, gosh. And, and I tell him I'm in a band. He's like, come here. And he sits me down at first time I ever saw a Macintosh computer in my life. Mm -hmm. Sits me down at it and says, all right, let's 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 build your newsletter. He goes, all right, do you have your logo? So I pull out my business card and I, I give it to him. And he put it on a scanner and it appeared on screen. I almost blacked out. <laughs> I was like, wow. how did you do that? Yeah. How did you take that piece of paper? And so I that night I created my first band newsletter. And I and I I got to tell you I used every font in the computer. Um, yeah, everyone. It looked like a ransom note when I came home. <laughs> it literally did every every page. But I came home and I see I see what would be my wife, it was mm -hmm. my girlfriend at the time, and I go, "Look at this! I did this myself." I was so blown away, and that was it. That's how I started every bit. That's that I'd never seen a Macintosh computer before. I'd never worked on a computer that wasn't a terminal, mm -hmm. right? Where it was just, you were pulling up data mm -hmm. and you couldn't do anything or, you know, and that was the first time I'd ever seen a computer. And I bought a Macintosh computer. I'm going to say 60 days later. Yeah. And about a, a year later, I opened up my own desktop publishing business and my wife and I, and now my, now it's my wife, my wife and I opened a small graphic design studio. And that's where I learned to write was writing copy for ads and it all came from doing a newsletter for for the band my wife and i were both in now i'm curious first of all amazing story do you still have that that newsletter do you have a copy somewhere 
Oh yeah, that absolutely. Is, that's awesome. Yeah, out, that's very garage. significant. That's very significant because that little piece of paper launched kind of a, a, an empire, which is which is amazing. Yeah, I have like twenty copies of it. It's really it's. That is. I wicked. look at it now, and of course, I cr- I I cringe. Of course, because every, I, it was a six panel newsletter, and every panel was like five different fonts. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I've been down the same road before. You should see some of my first websites I built. When I first started building websites back in the very late uh, 90s, I didn't even know how to connect the first page to the second page. I was like, okay, how do I link from to the about page? It's like, I, I would just tell people, I'm not sure how to get to it. So just type in about at the end. You know what I mean? It was horrific. And uh, it's come a long way. <laughs> But we'll get oh, more. Yeah. We'll get more into some of the career in a little bit too. But one of the things I like to, I'm going to mention one more thing here. I'm going to jump over and say hi to a few people quickly. One of the cool things I like. Now this is going to talk a little bit about photography. But when you're out and about doing your day gig, which is an amazing day gig, um, you know whether it's a professional shoot or just anywhere you're out there, you're always in a professional environment. You've always got a blazer on, real nice suit jacket, and you've got the Van Halen logo. Uh, popping through at the bottom of the jacket. And I know you're one of the world's <laughs> biggest Van Halen fans. I said I was going to argue tonight who's the bigger fan, but we'll, we'll go 50-50 on this one tonight. Uh, when did you discover Van Halen and how did they uh, impact you? So it's weird because I, I found Van Halen at different times in my life. Mm-hmm. But I would say it was once I was married. And because I, I would say that I was very used to what I would call the pop Van Halen, like jump and stuff like that, mm-hmm. right? But I didn't really know what I call what I call today like the real Van Halen. And so uh, one day my wife is talking to me and I mentioned something about Van Halen. She goes, oh, my God, I lo- they're my favorite band. I'm like, really? You don't really talk about them. She's like, are you kidding me? Jamie, Jamie's crying is like one of my best songs. Ever. I go, I- I've never heard that song. <laughs> and she's like, honey, that's the good Van Halen, not the stuff you're listening to. Okay. You need to go back and I'll. And so I went back and, and and she played the song for me, Jamie's Crying. And I was like, that's awesome. And that was it. So now, of course, I like I, you know, I have all those 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 classic songs that are just, you know, to me, like that's that's Van Halen. Yeah. You know, it's like, man, it was such a great time in there at their their sound and David Lee Roth and you know, the stuff that Eddie was doing on guitar was just so revolutionary. And uh, and the, everything, even the, like 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 the sound of Alex's drums. I mean, they had such a unique like they play their first note and you knew, yep. you know, and like and like uh, like was it Ice Cream Man and uh, some of those songs that were just like so like beautiful girls. I mean, it's just all those songs that are from way back then because they had kind of a blue side to them. Yes. And like that was it. It was my wife that really because I, I think I knew one Van Halen. And my wife knew a completely different one. It was when I uncovered that old stuff. That was it. I was like, these guys are amazing, you know. And then when I started playing guitar, of course, these are some of the first songs that I, you know, I took guitar more seriously. These are some of the first songs, you know, ain't talking about love, like one of the first songs mm-hmm. you learn in A minor. Yep. Uh, but all those, you know, there's just those songs are just so iconic. And and uh, I I remember, and I, this is maybe before your time. But uh, you really got me was used in an ad for the for the Nissan Z yep. Z uh, was a Z three hundred or ZX at the time. Uh, yep. And it and it was Barbie and Ken riding around oh, in a toy car. Not very and well. It, and and the way they cut that ad, where right where David Lee Ross like no 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 I no, know no, and they're riding in the that was just such a beautifully brilliantly put together ad and I don't know if you know the whole backstory on how that whole ad came about no I don't know the backstory on it it's a long time tell me about it well I'll tell you the backstory as I I I read it but this is a while ago Mm -hmm. so someone who was like a Van Halen historian would go well it's not exactly that but here's the story that I I read about it back in ad week so I read about this one because I used to have an ad agency so I got I subscribed to ad week of course well the uh neat so the guy at Nissan that came up with the idea for that Barbie and Ken ad basically kind of comped it together and he had the Van Halen he's tried all these different songs and he gets to you really got me the Van Halen version and he's like this is the song for the ad. This is it. So they he shows it to everybody in the executive conference room, and they're like, oh, my gosh. It's like this song was made for this ad. They go and they tell their agency, contact Van Halen. We want to license this song. And they said, no, just no, we're not going to do it. That's selling out. We're just not going to do it. <laughs> and anyway, they went on and on and on, and they got up to a million dollars. 
No, this is a million dollars back then. Yeah, twenty five years ago. Yeah, not a million dollars today. This yeah. was like ten million dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna and say they, ten. They just flat out said no. They didn't need the money, and they were just like, no, we're just not going to do it. So I guess the story goes, they called them to this agency in L.A., and they brought them all in, and they said they're getting ready to, you know, have the meeting. And so they pull up in the parking lot, they get out, and lined up are four Z100 3Xs with their names painted on the door. And they signed the contract right then and there. They go, we, we get these today if you sign. You drive them home. That's and they fantastic. all got them. <laughs> they all drove off. And that's 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 how they wound up doing that, that show. But when that song came out and all, it was just like, because I knew the original version. Of course. Of course. But then. There's all the other stuff, you know, is running with the devil and and Panama and some of those guitar riffs, they're so iconic and they're just so different. You know, it's not like learning, you know, uh, carry on my wayward son or something. Sweet home Alabama. The stuff that Eddie does on, on guitar, it's just different and it's just smart and it's so clever and you're like, how did he think of this? You know, it's like and, and the riffs sound easy. Like you listen to him, you go, oh yeah, that's easy, and then you start to realize what he's really doing, and you're like, this should be easy. <laughs> yeah. But he had he just had a he just had a way of adding a little nuance or a chord you've never played before or these little things where you go, wow, he he could have just gone with C, but no, <laughs> he had to do like a C add nine with a suspended fifth or some weird thing, and I was like, but you know those it's they made them what they are today. Very you hear those those. Those, you know, those riffs, and you're just like, ah. Very unorthodox. And back in the day, too, when he's building his own guitars and things like that, too, the technology wasn't there like we have today where we're spoiled with stuff that doesn't go out of tune, you know, and all this other kind of stuff. But, I mean, he was always inventing. And when you're watching him, you think he's just doing something for fun, but he's thinking. He knows he's going to have to do a whammy bar dive and to get back into the next part of the solo. You think it sounds great. He's pulling backwards on the whammy bar to throw his guitar back in tune. He's he's tuning his guitar as he's playing <laughs> iconic riffs. And he's I've always described it on the show as the kind of guy – Picture, maybe you can picture this. You're on the test track and you're in like this Formula One race car. It'd be like me or you getting in cars. I don't know how good you are with cars. I can drive, but I'm not a, I'm not a driver or a race car driver. I'd get in one of these Formula One cars and I would kill myself within about two minutes. Or at least I'd crash and wreck the guy's car. Eddie Van Halen is like that on guitar. He's that Formula One driver that's at the just at the cusp of blowing the engine and blowing everything up, but he always manages to to get to that finish line way ahead of everybody else, and he's like that on the guitar, whereas everybody else is going to crash and burn when they try to do the antics and the, the things on paper that just don't look like they're going to work. You know what I mean? What a great analogy. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, it is. And he always pulls it through. And it's I've also used the analogy, you know, you and I are very close to the same age. So remember back in the day driving the stick shifts, you know, or maybe our parents' cars and we don't know how to drive the stick shift too much and we burn out our clutches a little bit from riding the clutch or popping the clutch. So you've got oh, a yeah. weak clutch in your car and you know how to baby it. You know how to locate okay, it, let it go, let it go, let it go. Okay, we're driving. But your buddy, you know, maybe you have a couple of beers and you have your buddy drive your car home. He gets in the car, pop, pops a clutch and, and it's done. It's like, yep. don't, can't you drive it? Well, your clutches burn out, but you know how to do it. Right? Yep. Or have that finesse. Have, yeah, finesse. Or having action on your guitar. It's just t- so low. My my action on my guitars are in the buzz zone all the time. Someone plays my guitar and they're like, dude, that sounds like crap. And then I play it. I'm not a better player than them by any means, but I know the feather touch or I know how to baby the guitar, this guitar, and yep. I can get away with it. So it's just a balancing act. Love yeah. it. Well, I'll tell you, he, he does it in a, it just like nobody else does. And so it's uh it's just it's just the coolest thing. I don't get then there's nobody like him because there's other guys that are smoking on guitar, mm-hmm. right? You know, there's Steve I and guys like that. They're just amazing. But they're just not him. No, I know. You know as great as they are, and nothing against them because they're just they're all insane, but they all looked up to Eddie. Of course you they know, did. They were like, I they wouldn't be there without him. He led the way and he was he was that pioneer. Mm-hmm. But what's amazing is all these years later and all these great players and all this stuff has evolved and does that, but he's still the man. He is. How is that? You know, it's like, how are we using guitars today? Like, like I have guitars that, that were designed. Like I have three blueprints of guitars on my wall at my office mm-hmm. of the original Fender blueprints for the Telecaster. You know, that was like 1951. And like, like we're still using those guitars today. It's like you have the Telecaster and you have the Strat and you have the Les Paul and Eddie Van Halen as a person. Like, like these things were cast in stone so long ago, yep. and they're still great today. They're still amazing guitars. They're still, and he's just he, ridiculous today. 
There's a lot of guitar companies and uh, not just guitar companies, amplifiers and gear pedal companies, everything in between outboard equipment companies who are working today and have probably be uh, retiring very wealthy because of Eddie Van Halen, because he's up the game. You know, now they're changing amplifiers. People want more gain in their amplifiers to get what he had. Now they're getting pedals, you know, all kinds of pedals to get his sounds, um, you know, and a lot of people are working in the business because of him. And that's that's a, a, a known fact for sure. Yeah. It's it yeah I mean he's he's there's nobody like I think there's an impacted guitar the way he has and there's other legends you know there's BB King and there's Stevie Ray and guys yep. I look up to and admire and they're really great but he he inspired uh, uh, like so many people like he he made people say I've got to play guitar that's right you know and it but he was the whole package it, his playing was ridiculous insane the Einstein of guitar whatever. But it was his onstage persona and that, you know, just his his attitude about it. Just he made it look like such fun. He made it look like, isn't this awesome? I'm having such a great time. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I want to do that. You know, exactly. He really had an infectious like like smirk on his face. And he looked like you watch someone on stage and he's just like, oh, my gosh, that guy's having the most just the most fun. I agree. And even let's take away all the musical talent. Let's just say he had no musical talent. He just knew how to build the guitars. He, I mean, he's kind of like the Leo Fender, not able to, I, I mean, if he was like Leo Fender, I should say, and couldn't play, take away all that. But just he was a tinkerer and he knew how to build stuff. Um, the world would be a completely different place today with the instruments as we know it. I mean, there'd probably be some great stuff. I'm sure there would be. Uh, there's been other innovators, many of them, but I think it would be a different place going into the music store today, which you would see, you know, locking tremolos and high gain pickups and, yeah. You know, all this crazy, crazy stuff. So I think the his legacy will not just be his his licks. Uh, I mean, he's smart no. now with the EVH gear brand. He's finally sort of just gone from company to company, you know, sticking his name on something. He's, you know, got something he's built for himself, for his family, and for musicians today, tomorrow. And actually, one of his older interviews when he was um, promoting the Wolfgang when it first came out with EVH, you know, he said, I want this guitar to outlive me. I want this equipment to outlive me. It's my legacy, right? So, and I think he's built something with that brand that will outlive um, many of us. Agreed. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. We're going to get into some concert talk in just a quick second. I'm going to jump over and just say hi really fast to everybody. Um, over quickly in the chat, we've got Darren Moore, uh, Justin Grady, Quentin James joining in, uh, Scott MacArthur, uh, Tactical Six String, uh, Michael Bishop's joining us, uh, US American Made Guitars is here, uh, Futone, who I told you about off the air, Adam Reaver from fu tone.com. Yeah. Adam, I'm turning Scott onto Futone. We're going to have a, a new customer. I guarantee it. And uh, you trust me, what do you hear this? Um, uh, Lyle Ketchum's joining in. Uh, Michael Bishop is, is joining in as well, too. Carlos Santon, a fellow Canadian. Sinner for the first time in a little while. Good to see you, buddy. Adam EVH is jumping in. Good to have you guys here. Dirty Apes, Thomas Santiago. Uh, Kevin Landorf, good buddy of mine from the USA. Police officer, props to you, buddy. Uh, Thomas Santiago. Um, oh, good. He says he wants to tell you he got the 5150 Stripe Series guitar and have been playing it all week. Congratulations. Uh, very, very nice. Ooh, yeah. Nice select few of us have that guitar now. It's really nice. We're loving it a lot. Cutter Savage jumping in. A lot of guitar players here, Scott. Uh, let me see here. I know I saw one from a uh, Calby One member coming up here in a moment, too. Uh, let me see. Carlos Santos says, good old days of affordable concert tickets. I saw the Kinks in 1980. My first concert for a couple of bucks. Fantastic. Uh, Just wow. says Sammy Hagar's. Oh, I scrolled too fast. Where did I see that? Got to go back. I hate that when it happens. I'll try to go back as fast as I can. Um, uh, hoping for 58. Uh, let me see here. Oh, I think that was a serial number they're talking about. Uh, Just Grady says Sammy Hagar is doing a show in Philly and some decent seats are $200. That is, that's crazy. It's, it's hard to understand. Lyle Ketchum, kids say will never know how much fun they can have like we did just because everything is so expensive. Now, I agree with that 100%. Alex Corbett. Hey, Scott. Kelby One member watching. And I said hi to him as well, too. All right. Awesome. And we're going to... Some people here in the chat won't know about Kelby One, so we're going to tell you about that. And it's something that, you know, we kind of hinted at when Scott's talking about going into a desktop publishing place for the first time, starting a small business. Where do you see what that small business has become? It's 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 going to blow your mind. Um and Alex says, I'm no guitar person. I actually play trumpet. You know, the cool thing is you don't necessarily have to play an instrument here. Just come on and have fun. And, and people that join the show in the chat become family very, very quickly. And I'm very happy to have some of Scott's family come over here as well, too. Uh, Scott yeah. Mustang, I started on trumpet. Insomniac Matt's joining. 
Uh, let me see here. Who else have I missed? I'll try to scroll down a little bit more. Um, U.S. American Made Guitarist says, Scott set looks great. Yeah, it's very, very nice. We're going to see some of his guitars in that very shortly. And we're going to have some funny stories about some of uh, his music as well, too. Blackie DH is jumping in. Uh, scroll down towards the bottom. Quentin James. Um, as Quentin James did all the books for the band. Uh, we signed with a booking agency, which really took the pressure off me. That helps a lot. When you finally get an agent and a, you know that kind of thing, you can become a band member now as opposed to the manager or you know the ringleader and all that kind of stuff. Bane Rocks, yep. my son, who you met the other night, he's jumping in, saying hi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> great little guy. Let's see if I missed anybody else. Um, yeah, he is. Uh, Blimpus Rock Videos, the riff on I'm uh, I'm on Fire. Love it. Steve Hicks, hello from Vancouver Island. Steve's another fellow Canadian here. I love him. Uh, glad to have you joining, buddy. Hey, Steve. Uh, who have I missed? Anyone else here? Um, uh, and Carlos Santon says, apparently Eddie's Frankenstein is an incredible piece of crap. He's the only one who knows how to play it. Anyone else who's ever picked it up can't play the thing. That, that's true. It's it's a workhorse for sure. Um, when I played the one of the 300, uh, Darren and I, Darren DeMora was here and myself and uh, little Eric Jr. there, we played it, um, one of the 300, and it was a beautiful guitar, but I struggled on it. I'll have to admit, I struggled on it. And when I watched the video back, I didn't feel as bad as I did in the music store, but I certainly wasn't. I wasn't my confident self on that. So it's, it's a different beast for sure. And you go to use the whammy bar and you, you actually, Scott, believe it or not, you can take a whammy bar dive and you'll go about three inches before the uh, bar will even actually dive. It's just loose uh, like this. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. And speaking of which, that's actually my sponsor online right now. Mike's Music Online is up against this great show tonight. Thanks for making Fridays fun. Um, take a look at him sometime. If you're ever up in the in our neck of the woods, I know you travel up this way. Uh, Mike's Music Online, he's up yeah, in Thorold, which is up around Niagara Falls. Um, but you got to check it out. He's got some great stuff. He'd love to see you in the store. Uh, Jeff Revel says, uh, Scott and I support each other's oh, gear habits. Buddy. All right. Fantastic. Thanks for jumping in, Jeff. I, I appreciate having you over here. And Nemtal says, want to see his guitar collection. So my next question was going to be concerts, but I'm going to just segue that one for a second. And I've got a little bit of a gallery lined up, and Scott and I will be able to talk over this. And Scott, you won't see the gallery. Our fans will. Um, so I've got okay. two galleries, and I'm going to save the surprise one about the convention till later because I'm going to have to have you set that one up. Now, being, okay. being that you won't see the, the gear stuff here, I'm just going to kind of narrate a little bit. I'll queue it up to tell you what it is, and then you can kind of tell people okay. a little bit about it. They're going to go by probably about five okay. seconds each. Okay, guys, we're going to have a quick look at some of uh, Scott's gear. So the first shot is your shot at the wall. Uh, tell the people about the shot of the wall at, at uh, Kelby. Yeah, so this is the wall of my office. When we built new offices a couple of years ago, I I wanted my one of my walls to to look like uh, like uh, like a guitar store. <laughs> so I put eighteen guitars on the wall, and they're constantly changing. By the way, I even have sometimes our members vote on which which guitar for me to sell or which one to take home, and I raffle some of them. We uh, support a, an orphanage uh, over in Nukuru, Kenya. So uh, we'll sell the guitar, we'll sign it, we'll put it in acrylic and all that, and sell it. And we'll. And what's great is we're able to take a guitar that's you know inexpensive, you know, like a uh, a Mexican-made Strat or something, and raise three thousand uh, dollars nice. for the orphanage. So so that that's a constantly changing wall. Now that's at my office, so I, my my nicer guitars are at home. <laughs> And my kind of fun, just hey, that's you know, I always kind of wanted that guitar is just hanging at the office. Like I, I got an acrylic guitar there, which is my daughter's favorite. Uh, it's you know clear and all, but uh, everything's been on that wall from you know flying V's to uh, what do you call Jackson Dinkies and all just kinds of stuff. But that's basically it. It literally is the wall of my office, and then where I sit at my desk, uh, I've got a small amp and I've got two more guitars. I have a bass, and right now I've got like uh, it's not a Schecter Hellraiser. It's a uh, it's a Schecter. Okay. Because <laughs> they, I think they, I Schecter, I think uh, they make pretty decent, you know, heavy metal guitars. They do. I played. I I haven't really been a Schecter guy in my, in my life. Uh, some of the people who played in my bands over the years have played Schecter. I ran into a used one the other day at my local music store. It was a seven string, which I don't own. It was uh, a neck through. It was fifteen hundred bucks, and it was I mean normal. It was on for seven hundred bucks. I was like, oh man, I wish I had spare seven hundred bucks. It was beautiful. Um, but it, also the the slides that are going by too. There's the one with the hallway, so that's in your home at home, right? In your hallway at home. Right from where I'm sitting, it's right like literally I can see the guitars in the hallway right there. Yeah, okay. so that's in my home, and uh, that has twelve guitars on that wall. And that's another constantly, you know, changing one too. As I get new guitars, because I so I have a study, which is like kind of my office mm -hmm. here at the house, where I've got an amp and you know four guitars in there. So I rotate them in and out. Like you get tired of playing one for a while, 
Oh, or if I want one that's like tuned down a half step or yeah. you know, with a drop D or whatever, I'll just go and switch them out. So it's just for, you know, it's nice because that hallway's not far away. You can just walk over. Now, do you ever find office. yourself, do you ever find yourself kind of like, I, I get claustrophobic very, very easy. Do you find yourself like not, because it looks kind of narrow when those guitars are there. Do you ever bump into them walking down the hallway? Uh, so only at night. So like if, if I have to turn out the lights and then walk down the hallway, oh, no. so I take my, I take my, I take my phone. I thought I would hit them all the time because it's a hallway. Mm-hmm. It literally is a hallway. So I just take my phone and light the hallway because I don't want to hit one and knock it off or yeah. something. Now I specifically got those fender holders that have the glass thing around the little pla- clear plastic that comes and encompasses the guitar. Okay. So it, it would just fall off. It's like when you put the weight on it, it seals, Okay. you know, so it actually has a front in there they were a little more of a pain in the butt and a little more expensive but i don't want to hit them and have them fall and so far like in eight years i have not knocked one off the wall yet so i'm Perfect. in good shape i've got some hooks like that too hercules there they're, they probably have those in the states as well too but they they do that once the weights are yep. they click yeah they're handy for sure um so, yeah those are the actual stands i have in my office yeah the hercules. I, th- I thought i saw those yeah right yep. um now yep. tell me about uh the one shot um because we're back now from the gallery people are seeing both of us now on the screen the one shot was uh the stage look now i know what this is but tell people what that stage setup was that you have there all right so when we built these offices we decided to go with a rock and roll theme so in the back of the office we literally built a full working stage uh it's got you know set of drums uh, it's got, you know, a nice bass rig. It's got a Marshall stack. Uh, it's not an awesome stack, by the way. It's the, what would I call it? The baby Marshall stack. Cause there's the real stack. And then they make that one. That's a little skinnier, like three inches skinnier. Yeah. You know? And you look at it and you go, yeah, that's a Marshall stack. But if you get up real close to it, you're like, this is a little shorter than a Marshall stack should be. It's like half a foot shorter and about three inches, you know, skinnier. It's still a stack, but you know, hey. it's for the people who. Don't want to really pay for the full stack. And you know what? It's better than what most people have in their workplace. You know, their lounge, like in most places, you might you might have right. a, a water cooler and a microwave while you have a stage yeah. for your employees to jam. How often do uh, yeah. like guests and, and employees in that jam on it? Well, you know, so a, a, a lot of photographers have a crossover with music. Of course they right? do. They're already creative people. I can't tell you how many people even are, are building, you know, play music. So we like we'll have instructors come in to tape, tape a class and then we jam. And like the other, like maybe about a month ago, uh, uh, one of our instructors' uh, boyfriends had had gone to the Berkeley School of Music, and he pretty much played everything. And I could play bass, drums, and and guitar. So we would all switch instruments and just play. And it's just now when no one's there at night, we crank it up too. We crank it. But I go there a lot myself at night. So when everybody goes home, and accounting is usually the last department to leave. When account, accounting leaves, I plug in and I just crank it up and just blast it. Because, you know, when you get home and I've got a you know wife and kids and yeah. all, it's like I'm playing through a practice amp. Yeah. But there, there's nobody there and I'm in this big building. I'm like, <laughs> I love it. It's awesome. And, and it all works. The drums, they're a nice set of drums and, uh, you know, the bass rig works and I play bass. And I learned when I learned to play bass. We used our thumbs. Everything mm-hmm. was popping. And, nice. Uh, so I'll, I'll do some of that stuff. Yeah, but it's just, you know, and I'll walk over to my wall in my office, which is, you know, not far away, pick up a guitar. And we have one there for looks. We, we got a Les Paul, but it's a cheapy Les Paul. Mm-hmm. And we put, you know, a Kelby One logo on it and all. So I, I wouldn't say, I don't think I've ever played it. I think I picked it up once and you can tell this was designed to be used as a promotional item. <laughs> it's not really. So I just pull, I pull one off my wall and stuff. And, and the head that's on that stack too, it's not a real tube head. It's all state. Yeah. It's that kind of, it's that one that that's kind of hybrid. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, kind of hybrid. It's not, it's not a tube head. This is not something I would take on a gig. No, no. Because actually when I do, when I do a gig, I'll rent a half stack. Like I'll rent, we'll rent the back line Mm -hmm. and I'll actually rent a nice half stack. So it's, it's more for looks. The, I mean, it's all functional. Of course. But I couldn't really justify buying, you know, an incredible stack. Yeah. Just to leave there. Yeah. Just leave there and get maybe 10% of the use that you would if you owned it at home or in in another jam facility. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, but it's very awesome, yeah. though, to, to have that for guests, and, for employees, uh, for yourself. Yeah. And on the walls, we have, like, these big concert shots. And we have also, uh, in big parts of the wall, like, we have uh, lyrics from rock songs. Nice. Like, you know, like, we have ACDC lyrics. And we'll say, we'll put the line there, you know. And then, uh, 
you know, no, no stop signs, n- no speed limit. Yeah. Nothing's going to slow me down. ACDC. And then we have, uh, as you walk in the door, we have a, a column and going up the column is uh, a Bon Jovi quote. I've seen a million faces and I rocked them all. So we have all these things, this whole, and so outside my office, I have a wall and it's, uh, 12 or no, it's 15, 15 rock and roll lunch boxes. Oh, nice. So they're lunch boxes for rock bands, like literally like Judas Priest and the Beatles. And I mean, everybody you can think of all these different rock bands that I couldn't imagine actually had lunch boxes, but do probably all aluminum or tin destroyer. I got a kiss. Yeah, they're they're actually they're pretty good. You know what was interesting? Mm. How inexpensive you can get these rock and roll lunch boxes. The most I paid mm. for one was a Kiss Destroyer for uh, sixty five bucks on eBay. That's not too bad. But uh, you you can go to lunchboxes.com and buy them. And then we have rock and roll motorcycle helmets. Nice. So we actually bought motorcycle helmets that are all painted for rock and roll. And like one of them was ACDC. So we have three really cool. So the whole place has got this kind of rock and roll vibe. I love it. That's yeah, fun. That's it's wicked. Cool. And what a creative outlet too. And it's very funny too that you mentioned how the photographers um, and the, the, the photographers are into music. They're into the software. They're into Lightroom. They're into Photoshop, which obviously you're a guru in. It's a we all gravitate to that kind of stuff. Um, the multimedia. I, I have a, countless buddies this way as well too. And you like you see them play guitar, and then okay, they're great at photography, and they're they're good at this. It's really really cool to see that. But I think at the end of the day too, the photography it can and can't be. It can be a stressful job sometimes. It's nice to have that outlet just to go jam whether it's on the drums or whatever, but I, I really like that you've done that to have an outlet for the for the staff there and yourself too and and uh, uh, clients. It's wicked. Yeah, and honestly, that's, wh- that's what my little practice amp in my office is for. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes I just, now, now I will, I close the door, mm-hmm. right? Now I have glass, I have glass walls, but I mean, it's not the most soundproof, but I don't play it very loud. It's a solid state. I have a little tube and I have a little solid state and I just got the tube. The tube's like three weeks old, the solid state I've had for a while, Mm -hmm. but you know, you can play them at really low volume, bedroom levels, crazy low, Mm -hmm. you know, and like that black star, I can turn it down to one, one watt. But, but it was, it was one of Eddie's EVA champs was the first one that I ever heard of that let you go down to what five Watts was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is he got you go to five Watts? Yeah. And that was the first one. I'm like, that was a brilliant, to be able, because that's the problem. Tube amps sound great when they're cranked. Mm-hmm. Solid state amp, and I'll never forget the day where I ended my solid state amp love affair. Yeah. So I was playing at this is years ago, but at BB King's Bar and Grill, and so my guitar player is playing through, uh, literally a Fender mm-hmm. Twin Reaver, but with some effects, with some you know Boss pedals mm-hmm. and stuff, and and I'm playing through a Line Six at the time. And it was one of those Line Six with like a hundred presets and all, and it sounds fine when you're practicing. Yep. And it sounds fine. And and he and my guitar player comes over to me and I'm like, dude, your rig sounds so amazing, you know? And he goes, I'm gonna go I'm gonna play my rig. You go out front. Then I'm gonna go play your rig with my guitar. Mm-hmm. And he had a really, really nice fender. He goes out front, his rig sounds amazing. He's a tremendous guitar player. He goes and plays my rig. It sounded like a buzzsaw. Mm. I was like, that was it. That was the day where I stood up and I'm like, I I literally ordered a Marshall the next day, a Marshall combo amp. Yep. And I was like, that was it. I, I heard that buzz and I'm like, that buzz sounds great low. Yeah, of course. It sounds like crap in a band and it doesn't cut. You got to have those mid tones that cut through the band and it just, and I was like, I, I didn't want to play that night. I'm like, I don't even want, I don't want to play. It just, it sounds, I could, I, so I was shocked at how bad it sounded at, at level, at volume. Yeah, it sounds like you're chucking razor blades at the audience's ears. I, I know I've been there many times before too. I had a lot of the solid state PVs, like I had the you know uh, stereo chorus two twelves and the PV renowns, um, all that kind of stuff. I even had crates back in the day. What else did they have? I had some I of them. Great. Yeah, and they 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 come up for a while for a little bit there. I had some. Uh, oh, I had just about everything, and then finally getting into the tube amps. And it took me a while too with the tube amps. Even still with tube amps, I had a sound tech, um, a guitar tech one time throughout halfway through my career said, "Look, your sound is muddy." And he went over. He just turned my mids up. And now to this day, I turn my mids. And every single amp I play, clean or not, r- full, right on full, all the way across. And it's funny, you probably couldn't see the amps behind me. I'll turn my chair a little bit. I've got three of the EVH amps back there right now. 
And so there's, yeah, you do. Yeah, there's the two lunch boxes, which are very similar, and then there's the hundred watt head. And even the hundred watt head, people are scared because they might live in an apartment or things like that. They might be a gigging musician, but they still want to play the amp when they get home. You can play that amp on almost a bedroom level, like just louder than what maybe you'd play uh, like a little boombox stereo, um, about that level, and it still sounds like you're on the stage. And that's why they're not really joking when they say from the bedroom to the auditorium, because you can do that. It's uh, and it's fully too. So, and it, we just did that. So my buddy Jeff Ravel, who's in there, mm -hmm. uh, who's in the chat tonight yeah. on the show, he's like he's like a real guitar tech head guy. Like he knows all the he like builds his own guitars. He sands them. He I mean he builds them from scratch. Like here's a block of wood and I'm going to build a guitar. Yeah. So uh, I was do, I was doing a seminar in Virginia last month and every year when I do that he comes and we go to guitar stores the night before and we went to the hundred watt in the store. Nice. And we turned it way down, but we turned the gain way up and all. And, and it was it was my first time playing the big one mm -hmm. and oh my gosh it was amazing and he's like crank it up and i'm like dude i don't crank up my amp in a music store <laughs> that's like, i might as well play stairway to heaven i don't either i don't either anyway, no 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 i play it. but i was able to play it at such a low volume but it sounded amazing it was like this is like i was just i was stunned he's like dude you gotta he was the one that made me try it he goes he finally goes come over here you, you gotta try a real amp i'm like okay but i i just i still can't get over how amazing this giant amp sounded, 100 watt, you know, massive. Uh, but the distortion was incredible I know. at such a low volume. I think I remember that day too. Uh, we, we were kind of tw uh, exchanging tweets back and forth and you said you arrived at this area early, whatever. So you're, you're with your buddy and you're going to go hit the music stores. And I said, make sure to check out some EVH. Yeah. And, yeah, we had some fun banter back and forth with that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, we did. Don't worry. <laughs> that is awesome. I he's love got it. A bunch, he's got a bunch of EVH gear. He's got all kinds of discretionary income. So he's got all kinds of EVH gear. He's like EVH'd out. Oh, yeah. man. Tell he's him, got the lunchbox. He's yeah. Got big one. Tell him to hit me up because I'd love to see some of his stuff and I'll feature some of his stuff on the web pages or on the Facebook page as well, too. I love seeing that kind of stuff. So, yeah, reach out to me. That'd oh, he's got a big collection of guitars, everything, too. Yeah, he's great. a great guy. He's been a friend of mine uh, for many, many years. Love it. Um, let's jump over to another band that we talk about on the show a lot. It's really, really funny. I, I never realized until I started you know, watching back some older shows how much I talk about them. Second band I think I talk about as much on the show other than Van Halen is Kiss. You're a Kiss fan. Saw that in your bio, which, by the way, you have an awesome bio. I wish I, wish I had uh, the luxury of all my guests that come on the show to have a bio available I can pick and you know cherry pick some good things from. So it was very, very helpful. Um, but then again, too, I've been to your website so many freaking times, I almost know the copy by verbatim. But uh, I was like, <laughs> what did Scott say about photography? i got to pick one more tip. But um, So Kiss. Now, I I'm just going to guess, but this is going to be a hard guess because you're a guitar player and a drummer as well. So you know, Ace Frehley could have been your ticket to Kiss or it might have been Peter Chris. What got you into Kiss and it was who was it that, or maybe it was just the band per se? I really liked Paul Stanley. Oh, okay. I just really, I loved, I loved his stage persona. And uh, I mean, I thought Ace Frehley was great, but you know, like I said earlier, like I, they told me you're going to go to this concert and these people are going to wear makeup and I was completely uninterested in going. And so we went and mm -hmm. they came on stage and I was, I'm seriously, I didn't know what to expect. My jaw was on the floor. And by the time they got to their third song, I'm like, this is my favorite band. Oh my God, they're so great. And that was literally like 19, maybe 70 kiss alive. The lat album, it just mm -hmm. came out and I didn't know of kiss. I'd maybe heard the name before, but I knew I couldn't tell you anything about the band. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so this is on their first kiss alive tour. And, uh, and like I said, thin Lizzy mm -hmm. opened. And Kiss was just, just, I was just like, this is, I bought all their posters. I went home with Kiss shirts. I was just absolutely in love. And then when they came to town the following year, I was completely indoctrinated. I was like, I'm a Kiss fan. And I was there the night Ace Fraley got electrocuted. No way. And we, I was in the crowd that happened in Lakeland, Florida. You can look it up. Okay. And we're all thinking, hey, that's cool. It's part of the show. <laughs> And then he did, Kip didn't get up. We're like, okay, that's enough. Okay, yeah. Okay, I Knock get it. Knock it off, Ace. You're supposed to be dead. Yeah. And then we saw guys come running on the stage and all. But we saw him go down, and we just thought, you know, it was literally maybe the second song. And so we thought, hey, this is really cool. And, you know, it was like they were doing Detroit Rock City or something. Mm -hmm. Boom, he goes down. And we were just like, yeah. And so it was, you know, it was just crazy. But um, – so that's how I kind of, you know, I wound up, you know, you got to realize at that time, I'm literally probably 17. Mm -hmm. 
right? So when all this is coming down and uh, became a, you know, a Kiss fan. And I've seen them many, many times over the years. Uh, luckily, they come through my hometown. And I just recently saw them with uh, op- with Def Leppard opening. Oh, very nice. And I took my son. So my, my son was 19 at the time. He's 20 now. But he, they came through town. And, we got, and I had to get great seats. I'm like, son, we're going to spend a little extra money. We're going to get great seats. And we were like 10 rows from the stage center. Nice. And, uh, and I thought, well, I like Def Leppard. I've always liked Def Leppard. But I've never really heard too much about them live. We'll get past them, and then Kiss will be great. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe how good Def Leppard was live. They were great. I was like, I never expected this. I just, I don't know why. I just thought, you know, they were just, they would play their songs and all, but I thought they were just tremendous. And uh, and then Kiss was, of course, Kiss, you know. (laughs) They were so in your face, you're just... It was just like I was when I was a kid. You know, there was so much going on, so many monitors, so much explosions, so much everything. I imagine you you could probably but, feel uh, the heat great. right from the from the columns of fire from oh, ten rows back. Absolutely, absolutely, we could feel it coming off the stage. And you know, their stage show was really was very very. You know, it's essentially the same stage show they've always done. Yeah, with a slightly different stage layout. I mean, but it's just they played all my favorite songs, just like Def Leppard did. You know, it's like I hate when you go to a concert and they don't play your favorite songs like you expect. You know, it's like also I hate when you go to a concert and they open up with a song you've never heard. Yeah. Or a cover, a cover like somebody else's cover. Like I remember going to see Pat Benatar. She opened up with some song I never heard of. I'm like, what is this? You could do a whole concert of nothing but hits. Why are you playing this song nobody's ever heard? You know, it's like, start off with something that we can all just go, yay, you know, heart, heartbreaker. Yeah. It's like, play something, Don't save it all for the encore. Cause, you know, there are some bands out there like Kiss, like Def Leppard, that can play an entire concert and never play anything that wasn't a hit. Oh, I know. You know, Van Halen's the same way. Yeah. And, uh, so, but uh, Van Halen did not disappoint when they were in concert. <laughs> I'll bet. Well, and if you are going to do a cover, do own it. I mean, freaking own it. Like I've I've seen some bands before too, and a lot of the younger generation. Well, this will happen to them, especially today, because everyone's going back and redoing songs. But a song you're like, wow, oh, yeah. that was. You hear that song that uh, Kiss did, or so on. That's awesome. Well, no, no, that's been done three times before. You're like what? You know what I mean? So own it if you're going to do it. it. Breaks my daughter's it breaks my daughter's heart when I when I know the words to a song she's singing. Like she hears a song on the radio. She's eleven. Yeah. So she hears a song and I start singing. She's like, "How do you know the words?" I'm like, "Oh, honey, this song's thirty five years old." That's right. What? She's like incensed by it. Like, no, no, that's my music. I'm like, no, honey, that's my music. Exactly. <laughs> uh, my boy Eric is the same same age and it's same same school for that as well too. Because uh, so he'll think, "Oh, this is something that's just written, you know, a couple years ago." But it's just cool though. It's nice. Yeah. Then, then you discover what it was, and then they might turn on to that stuff as well too, which is nice. But I'm going to take a slight tangent here as well, just because we're talking about Kiss right now, and this is going to be a really fun setup. So let's uh, we're going to go towards the end of the program, and we're going to rewind a little bit. Um, t- tell us a little bit about your day job. Tell us about how Photoshop works into your world. Tell us a little bit about Kelby One, and then tell us about this convention. Once we get to the convention that y- you know about, we're going to show a little bit of a gallery right. from that, which ties into Kiss. So I'm going to let you set that up. Tell us about what you do uh, for your day job. All right, so my day gig is I, I run an edu- a worldwide educational community for photographers uh, and people that use Photoshop, basically. And so uh, it, it started, uh, you know, back in the 90s, and it's just grown and grown and grown. And we have members in 102 countries around the world. We publish Photoshop User Magazine. Uh, we do seminars all over the country and in Canada and in the UK. And... Uh, we uh, we do it basically now today. It's mostly based on just online training, right? Full courses, and we have eight hundred courses on Photoshop and photography and Lightroom and stuff like that. Well, once a year we do a big conference in uh, you know Adobe is the company that makes Photoshop. It's called Adobe Photoshop, and we do a conference that we've done since nineteen ninety nine called Photoshop World. Mm-hmm. Well, every year at Photoshop World we we pick a theme, and the theme is for fun. So we, we start off the conference by using this particular theme and it gets everybody, you know, into it. And we spend an insane amount of money on the opening keynote because it, it lets everybody know you're going to be here for three days and we're all going to be learning Photoshop. And it's thousands of people from all over the world come to this conference. But we want to let them know you're going to laugh. You're going to have a great time. You're going to make friends. It's like, you know, when you're having fun and you're learning, it just makes the learning It makes it, it opens your mind to creativity. It helps you remember stuff. I mean, there's a million reasons why having fun when you learn is just the most awesome thing. So we, we produce a movie. 
that opens the show. But we do everything. Like we we theme all the graphics to it and all. And I'll give you some of the themes in the past. Uh, we did a, a Top Gun theme where we did an eight minute movie and you, and we honestly, I'm not making this up. Some of our scenes looked better than the actual Top Gun movie, <laughs> which is done a lot. We built an airplane cockpit. We did all this stuff. And we, we, I had sh scenes from a carrier I was on. We had great footage. We had U S Navy footage. We had all this different stuff. We went to all these different locations. We get all, we buy all the uniforms and everything to make it as much like, a movie, like an eight minute movie trailer. So we don't do a whole movie, but it's like a movie trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, we did Wayne's World. Oh, I love uh, it. And we went out to the Nevada desert to feet, do the scene where uh, he meets Jim Morrison and all this stuff. We, we spend a tremendous amounts of money. We did a Star Trek theme. We were able to rent the Star Trek set to be able to tape all, the bridge of the, of the Enterprise. Oh, my God. And listen to this. <laughs> we got to do, one year our theme was CSI. Okay. We got to tape it on the CSI set in Hollywood. No way. One of our one of our members is the official photographer for CSI, and listen, I'm a kid you not. So I believe, we're standing I believe there you. And we're doing we're doing this we're doing this like you know funny movie about what we do is basically replace real life with Photoshop. Sure. Right. So we're on the set at CSI. We have our lab coats on. We're watching them tape a scene. They would break for lunch, and we would walk onto the set and start taping ours. They let us on the Paramount lot have the run of the no, CBS lot, have the run of it. And it was just amazing the doors that have opened over the years for people to let us do stuff. So one year we got the idea to do the story of a band that comes together and we were going to base it on, do you remember the VH1 series behind the music? Loved it. Right. That was a great series. I, I mm -hmm. love that. And and they would look at like the history of a band and how they broke up and the fighting and the stories and the scandals and all. So we put together a story like that where the band came together and they decided that they were going to wear makeup. And the thing that broke the band apart was two of the guys in the band, me and another guy, mm -hmm. uh, both wanted to wear the same makeup. But instead of putting like a star like Kiss or the cat, we put Photoshop tools. And we both wanted the same tool, which was the clone stamp tool. So we were both Paul Stanley <laughs> and we, and it became this bitter dispute and we want, you know, so anyway, so at the conference, um, uh, we play this movie and by the way, we went and hired the original voice actor for VH ones behind the music. We found the actual guy that did those voiceovers, great voice, and did the narration for great voice. We hired him and gave him the script. He was awesome to work with. And, uh, and it looked, you would watch it and you would swear you were watching. We went to like more sound recording studios to record different parts of it. And we built stages and we had, we had the full costumes, the whole nine yards. Um, and so we play an eight minute movie and then we recreated the, like the kiss stage. And so since we were all musicians, we actually came out and played rock and roll all night, but we had using Photoshop words. So it was, I want to Photoshop all night and retouch every day. <laughs> and so uh, the pictures that you're going to see I'll set are, them up. are from our opening keynote. All right. So tell them what NAP is instead of KISS. So uh, NAP was the Pro National Association of Photoshop Professionals. Right. And so that's what the conference was originally. Photoshop uh, World was that. And then we rolled NAP into Kelby One, uh, to, to Kelby Training. So now it's just called Kelby One. But at the time that you're seeing these a few years ago, it was still called the National Association. So that's why it says NAPP instead of KISS. Gotcha. But that, th the sign did all the same stuff the KISS sign does. It chased up this way and up and down in different colors and one letter at a time. It, it was. We, it, it, we we spent just so much money making it look right. But can I tell you what the scariest part was? Sure. So look at the, if you can see the shoes I'm wearing, I'm, I'm wearing literally eight inch heels. Yeah. So I'm, I'm telling, I'm, I'm telling my wife before the concert, I'm like, honey, I, I'm really worried about these heels, you know, because if I fall, I'm probably not getting back up. Well, you could break an ankle and then easy. It's be on you yeah. Or, and I, it's going to be on YouTube forever. Yep. So somebody told us, well, with those high heels, you're going to have to wear a leg brace. So I put these leg braces on and my wife is teasing me relentlessly. She's, oh, you're going to be fine. You're, are you kidding me? It's nothing. I walk on those things all the time because <laughs> she does wear five, you know, those five inch stiletto heels or whatever. And I'm like, but honey, it's, it's, it's very hard getting around in those. I was stunned. I felt like I was walking on stilts. I bet. I mean, it's, they're really, really, 
I, I was surprised. So we're in the dressing room the night, the morning of the show, because this show's in the morning. It's a morning kickoff for Photoshop World. And we're backstage. I'm in my full costume. I got the wig on, the whole nine yards. And I'm just talking. I take a step back and I fall. Oh, no. In the dressing room. I fall and there was a sink and I grabbed one arm onto the sink and my buddy grabbed me and I stopped just short of hitting my head on the floor. Oh geez. So they pick me back up and my wife walks over and she looks me in the eye and she goes, you walk straight out to the microphone. You plant your feet. You can point, you can gesture, you can do it. Do not walk. Yeah. You walk out and you stand. And then we had a kabuki stage just like Kiss. Mm -hmm. So the drums go and the stage drops. The curtain drops from the front and then they suck it off to the left. And uh, anyway, and there we are with the smoke cannons and the whole nine yards, the racks of amps, the big, I mean, it was, and people, the audience was like, they jumped to their feet. <laughs> the whole audience, thousands of people jump and they're like, yeah. And it was it was just so so that's what these the pictures that you're seeing those are from our opening keynote that's the links we go to to go you're gonna have fun and then when that was over we did like a behind the scenes blooper so the behind the scenes blooper was three minutes and forty five seconds that's how much time I had to get my makeup off and get all this stuff you know come out I greet everybody you know we played the song right we played rock and roll all night yeah I had to get off. Get all the makeup. I had two makeup artists. They're they're trying to get all that caked on makeup and all. But uh, the hardest thing was uh, those those shoes were, however high you think they are, it's so much worse. Just like I, I don't know how they do it. I have no idea. I don't care how many years you walk on it. It's like walking on stilts. I know. I mean, women, like you say, with your wife, were in the high heels. I mean, uh, you know, even my uh, Sandra Lee here, she wore high heels, and they they could almost run. I think they can run in them. Um, but oh yeah, I couldn't do. I can't do that. I can't walk in high heels. I mean, you know, if I was to do well, the kiss well, type the thing, the shoes are they're blocks. They're I know, blocks. like they're, a cinder block. You don't have a foot. Yeah, you don't have a foot down. Like your your toes are down on the ground, and then your heels up. Mm -hmm. Your whole foot is up. It's like walking with, with big blocks of wood attached to your feet. And I, I didn't think it would be that hard. I was way wrong. Yeah, because your your foot's not the center anymore. You're you're up off the ground. Um, it's a, Your equilibrium is a little messed up. It's a little bit of everything. Oh, yeah. And as you said, you and so I both shots, get a height. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so the, the shots you're seeing there are taken by, a, uh, by an amazing concert photographer. Most of them are from Alan Hess who is a uh, concert photographer. He's the house photographer out in San Diego at the concert hall there. And uh, he actually teaches a class at Photoshop World on how to shoot concert photography. Oh, fantastic. And so, uh, yeah, so uh, that's, uh, and so my band actually plays a live set for that class. So they teach how to do it and then they come in and, you know, in a real concert situation, photographers are allowed to shoot three songs, the mm -hmm. first three songs. And then they literally, they don't, they don't make you just leave the front they make you leave the building. Like yes. they walk you to the back doors and go bye. I mean, it's like they throw you out uh, unless you have a ticket. They literally escort you to the door. Yep. So they bring them in for three songs and let them shoot the band. Then we take a break. They do some more teaching. Then they give them three more songs, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. And we get to play, and it's just <laughs> we get to jump around and have have fun and be be teenagers. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I, I agree with you on that. I know that for a fact because I shot the ones that you saw, the ones for uh, Van Halen for Molson Amphitheater. I shot for Live Nation in uh, 2015. Ooh, those were great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I had a lot of fun. They were like, really good. I was, as far as from me to the webcam away here, I was that close to Eddie Van Halen. And at one point, I'd motioned, give me a guitar pick, right? And he went to grab it, and then he had to hit a riff again on the, and he just couldn't do it. He, he goes like this like, kind of thing, right? But three songs. And then, sure, the, just like you say, they usher you right out. Um, and then, fortunately, yeah. I had a ticket. So my son was back with my one of my police officer friends that came down with me. So he's watching him back in the crowd. And then I, I, I literally went out of the front gate all the way around and entered like uh, the regular people and went back and sat in my seat. So, uh, yeah, they do usher you out. So it's fun, though. Isn't it's that a, it's a real feeling like you're part of it all and then immediately they throw you out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like, you're here, part of this event. You're capturing it. You're you know, and then you're, you're like out with the trash. I, I know. <laughs> and now is a perfect time for us to talk weird. a little bit about some photography. And I wish at the time too, when I took those shots, so the ones that you saw and a lot of people that watch the show saw those photos uh, that I took. I was, I ran two bodies on that and I, I, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit one of them was just a Nikon D3200, but I had a D7200 
So on the 3200, I'm running a uh, Sigma 50 millimeter lens on that one. And on the 7200, I'm running the All 18 right. to 35, which is one of my favorite lenses and very nice for video as well. Love it to death for video. And I just got my Sigma 70 to 200 shortly after. And even though I was quite close to Eddie Van Halen, there was a few shots where I could have got Alex with a 70 to 200. I could have shot across the stage and got Wolfgang on the far left, um, you know, which would have been nice. But grand scheme of things, I'm very happy with how they turned out. But let's talk a little bit about photography. And and I have to tell people here this um, it's to set this up a little bit. Number one, is photography is how I discovered you. Then I found out down the road that you're a good musician, great musician. And um, so it's not just the photography. It's your talk show itself, The Grid, which I watch as much as I possibly can and been a huge, when I say huge, I want to capitalize all four letters of that word to say huge inspiration on this show. Um, I mean, yours is more high tech than what mine will ever, ever really need to be, but it's, it suits you for what you do, right? Um, but the photography aspect, on your show a few days back, I think it was last Thursday's show, I, I think that's when it was, you had talked about finding yourself as a photographer. So someone, and a lot of us watching the show right now, maybe have a, a passion for photography. Maybe I'm, I might like to get into photography. It sounds like it's fun. Maybe just to capture, I've got a new baby now. I want to take better pictures of my family. Um, how does one find themselves as a photographer? Like, okay, you shoot people, you shoot sports, you shoot a lot of interiors, and you've excelled at that. But how does one find their voice or their niche as a photographer? Well, you know, when we first start out, you kind of have to shoot everything. Because mm -hmm. at first, you don't really know what you like. And, and you just said it. Like, people will say, I'm going to buy a camera because just, we just had a baby, right? Or I, I bought a camera because I'm going to take a trip to Italy, and you buy it for a particular reason. And then later you go, you know, hey, I think I had a fun time. I got some good shots in Italy, you know. Maybe I should try some other stuff, you know. And so what you wind up doing is is a little bit of everything. You you literally wind up shooting everything. You're shooting flowers. You're shooting architecture. You're shooting travel. You're shooting your kids. You're shooting your neighbor. And then when someone finds out you have a good camera, you're shooting somebody's wedding. Yes. And you just – you wind up doing all these different things. And so – the first thing is you have to shoot everything, but if you ever want to get good at anything, right? And this goes for music as well. You're going to have to figure out who you are as a, as a photographer. Mm -hmm. You're going to figure out, okay, what is the thing that I seem to have a knack for? Or what is the thing that people told me? Wow, those, you took those, those are really good, you know? And it's like, imagine how good a guitar player you would be if you said, uh, um, it, it, sorry, my headphone is talking to me here. No problem. Uh, it, it, if, if you had to be a guitar player that was really, really good at country and at jazz and at blues and at, at classic rock and at heavy rock and at, at metal, and it's like, you know what I mean? At some point you're like, well, I'm not going to be good at all of them. Right. When I decide who I am as a guitar player, if I decide I'm going to be a blues player, then mm -hmm. I can focus and your chances, your chances of being a success when you know what your what your thing is like, I want to be a blues guitar player. Well, you pretty much know which notes you're going to be playing <laughs> and you can kind of focus in on that. Photography is the same thing. If you go, you know what I realize? I just don't, I'm not any good at people. I'm just going to be a landscape photographer. The day you can say, I seem to have a knack for this. I seem to be pretty good at landscape. And you start focusing just on landscape. It's like focusing on one genre of guitar. All of a sudden your skill in that one area just blossoms. Yes. You know, it's like, yeah, it's just like anything else. It's just like, you know what? I'm just going to work on blues. Man, your blues playing goes through the roof. Nothing, you don't get better, better at anything else except for the fact that as you start to understand the blues more and you get more proficient and you start using different scales and you're expanding beyond just the blues scale and things like that, when you decide to do something else, you've kind of built the foundation to where it's easier to learn the next thing. So same thing with photography. Once you get to be a really good landscape photographer, if you decide then I'm going to do travel, you'll take some of that stuff that you nailed at landscape and you'll apply it to your next thing. But I think the, the first start is focused. And I think it's that that way pretty much any, you'll never, not never, you will rarely meet somebody that's awesome at everything. Right. In, in any, any musical genre or any photography genre. It's that focus that really takes your, your skills to the next level. I appreciate that. And something that I told you um, off the record the other day when we, we were talking uh, yesterday, I said where well, I discovered that I might be okay at it, and this is, this is not that long ago. I'm going to say probably I'm going to go back about four years. 
And um, I was like, because I'm a web developer and I build websites and, you know, that kind of thing for people. And the nice thing is now I can add photography. I have added photography and videography to my repertoire. And I actually like them more than building the websites now. For number one, uh, videos and photography uh, photos don't break. Websites break all the time. You know what I mean? So I got to I gotta be <laughs> yeah, techie, you know? So I would go do a website for a customer and they would say, um, can you shoot my staff or can you take some, maybe some, you know, some exterior shots, whatever, or some of my products? I'm, and I literally said to them, oh, ma'am, sir, you don't want me to do that. I suck. And I mean, I mean, what does that say for a confidence level? Number one, okay, well, if you say you sucked, maybe you suck at web design too. And so I started evaluating what I was saying to people. I was like, that's not really putting a good, um, you know, image on my business or on myself. So I went out and bought a cheap, cheap, cheap one of the $200, uh, you know, Nikon point and shoots. Didn't even shoot raw, just JPEG. I didn't even have a viewfinder, which is we're talking like just you're looking through, you know, your live view type of thing. Still have it today. Uh, it's uh, actually the, the wife's and the boys now. Um, and so I went out and I was taking a couple shots that weren't too bad. I mean, uh, so I said to my staff, okay, uh, yeah, I, I can do this. So I stopped saying I sucked and I didn't say I was good. I just stopped saying I sucked. And I got a little bit of confidence, just a little bit. And it helped. Yeah, and you know what? You, you don't, even if you suck, you don't want to say you suck. No, you can't. Because you don't want that, you don't want that in your head, no. number one. And you certainly don't want to put it in a client's head. But uh, like, you know, you were nice enough to share some of your images with me the other day. And uh, I think I think you you underrate yourself as a <laughs> your quality of photography, like like your rodeo stuff. Dude, you're shooting rodeo rodeo. I shot a rodeo once. Rodeo is very hard to shoot. Your rodeo shots were great. Thank your you. Your concert shots at Eddie were, were were wonderful. I mean, that was you know, I mean, you were shooting for somebody. I mean, you were on on assignment. So that's, you know, that fact that you could go on assignment for stuff. But but I mean, a lot of it is having the confidence. Uh, I, I know a lot of guitar players who are who are, I mean, and this is going to sound weird, mm -hmm. are technically proficient. Right. Mm -hmm. In other words, they know all their scales. They're very, very fluent around the guitar. They can get up and down the neck really well, but they don't. And I think I don't know what the right word is. Soul? Is authority? They don't play. They don't. Well, soul is one thing, but also not playing with the the authority to step on stage. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. Like I was talking to my daughter. So my daughter's going to do a presentation at school, and that she's going to have to use a handheld mic. And I tell her, I said, now, honey, when you get on that mic, don't think that that mic is going to amplify your regular voice. You have to talk really, really loud with a microphone in your hand, you've got to project and you've got to, and I said, so when you go on the microphone, I said, like when I am on my show, I go, if I'm around the house and I just kind of talk like this, hi honey, what are you doing? Oh, that's cool. I said, when I go on my TV show, I'm like, all right, welcome to the grid. It's Thursday. And I go, you see how I lift my whole body and I'm projecting out and all, you're going to have to do that with a mic. And she did. She nailed it. And everybody was like, oh my God, where did that come from? Awesome. I know a lot of guitar I know a lot of guitar players that are in that genre in which they technically know like the scales and the chords and the song, but then they're, they're not, they couldn't walk on with the band and play that song because they would get lost. They're just, they don't have that. And, and really it is a, it's a part of it is confidence, right? And even if they know the song, you have to play with authority. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've known drummers, drummers, especially that would, they, they play meekly. You know, it's like, you've got to, you've got to, you got to play, man. I mean, it's got to, you got to sit there and it's got to, you know what I mean? And same thing with the guitar. You might get away with it with jazz, but when you, when you play rock guitar, you mm -hmm. have to rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's not just chords. It's not just notes. It's not turning your amp up loud. You have to play with that authority, right? You have to do that in photography as well. Like to be able to do the stuff that you're doing now there's an authority behind your work and there's a, and, and you're playing, by the way, I saw some videos of you playing. <laughs> I, all I could think of is I'm watching you, you're playing eruption on stage. And all I can think of is like, I have to sell my guitars. Oh, I have geez. to sell all of the, I've got to find something else to do because guys like him are out there. It's like, I, I your guitar stuff was, was, ah! but anyway, thank you. Uh, but besides that, it, that is such an important part of whatever we do. That, that having that confidence, taking pictures with authority, playing with authority, talking on a mic with authority, mm -hmm. singing with authority. And I've seen people like get in front of a mic and they're like, go to karaoke and just die. Not because they don't have a good voice, not because they didn't know the words coming across the screen, because they didn't, they don't know how to 
I'm trying to not use cuss words. No, I, I really. I am. know what you're saying. Here, here's an, maybe another analogy too. So we'll, we'll use music and we'll use photography as two different analogies. So in the music world, you can either be a visitor to that stage or you can be a resident of the stage. The, the visitor is going to come up. Well, this is what it's like to be on stage. This is neat. No, I live here. I'm here for 45 minutes or I'm here for an hour and a half. I live here. And when I was like that in the band, you know, some people thought I was cocky or whatever else. But yeah, I, of course I was. When I was on stage, I was as cocky as they come. Um, I would, you know, when I'm off the stage, I'm this little mouse over in the corner. Yes, please. Can I have some? Can I have another drink, please, waitress? Thank you very much. And then I'm on stage. I'm like, yeah, you know what I mean? Because you're there to do a job. Now, photography as well, too. I'm a newbie when it, when it comes to photography. But I know because of band experience, let's just say if it was a wedding example. I go to the wedding. It's my first wedding to shoot. And I've only shot one. And I don't know if I ever want to do one again. But it was very good experience for me. And it was for family. So it was good. Um, and I didn't have to worry about lawsuits and things like that, you know, at least yet. And, um, you know, but I, if I go up to the, the bride, excuse me, Mrs. Bride Lady, um, would you like me to stand over here? Or I go up over here. Come on, guys, round up. Uh, Mom, come over here. Even if I don't know what I'm doing, I can actually convince them that maybe I do a little bit. And now they feel like I'm a Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and if you don't, yeah. it will come. It will come. Owning yeah, the space. And, and it will. And it will with photography and it will with with guitar as well, you know. But it's like, you, you just said it. You got to own it. Mm-hmm. Like if you get up there, you, you you know, if you act, you know, like I'm not really supposed to be here. That's how it comes off. That's how the audience, that's how your presentation is. And if you're walking around a wedding, like, you know, I'm not really, really that good. Well, you got to be like, all right, I need the mom and dad over here. All right. Where's the sister? Get over. Like, that's here, right. Move in and everybody eyes towards me. Yes. It's like all that kind of stuff is like, you know, I, I'll never forget. We were in San Francisco doing a presentation for Adobe. Mm. We were celebrating at that time. I think it was the. 20th anniversary of Adobe Photoshop. So I think it was 20 years and we did a presentation in a theater in San Francisco. We had a guy on our video team that wound up flying out with us and he was going to direct the union guys that were there, right? So it's all union staff. And he goes in and he's like, hello? Oh, geez. Hello? Can I get the light over here? And we, we, we called him off stage immediately and said, you got to tell them what to do. You got to boss them around. You got to, and he's like, well, it's just not his personality. He walked back to the stage. It, it was a, it was an amazing transformation. He got it. He understood what he needed to do. And he's like, all right, I need two spots right here. One <laughs> over here. And he just starts yelling. And we're like, and, and he was able to make that jump because he didn't have a choice. Like that show's coming up and that, that presentation's coming up in six hours. And he was the director. Like I'm on stage, I'm, I'm doing my presentation, all these other people are Adobe people doing it, but it was our gig. Like Adobe hired us to do this and he's the director. He owned it. And it was a neat, a neat thing to see when someone realizes the, that the gravity of the situation, you're either going to rock this or you're not. He rocked it. And he, probably for the rest of his life now, he's going to do very well at every kind of speaking and he'll get better every time. Oh yeah. And you know, the next time he went into that situation, he, he broke that ice. He knows what's expected. He knows what to do and stuff. And so and when I when my first time on stage, I just couldn't wait to get on stage. I was like all it's like all I ever wanted to do was play in a band. Like from the as soon as I got drums, I was like, I got to have a band. <laughs> like as soon as like I always like my first night on stage, I was just like so excited. Uh, I remember uh, the first time I ever got to play in like a really big hall. It was it's called the Sun Dome and it's okay. a dome stadium in Tampa, Florida, and my band got got uh, hired to play a huge party at the university. And we're just four guys in the band. And uh, we got to play on the same stage Rod Stewart was on two days before us. So we're used to playing in some podunk club in the middle of nowhere. And and then now we're, we're playing on this giant stage. And so we took all the money we made for the gig to hire a PA and lighting company. Because we don't, we didn't have. We're it's a dome stadium. Yeah. it's like a dome. You need lights. It's like it seats eleven thousand people. I mean, I saw Rick Springfield there, and like two days before is Rod Stewart, and you know, I saw all these concerts there. It, it's a big, you know, place, and so uh, we spent all the money, every penny we had, on just br- hiring a, a a PA and lighting company, and we had dressing rooms, same ones the Stars had back in the back. It was very exciting. Nice. Anyway, we come we come out on stage and. Uh, the very first song was um, Don't You Forget About Me uh, by 
whoever did that song, and then uh, Bang a Gong oh, right by on. Robert Palmer. <laughs> he was back in Power Station or something. Yep. That was the second song. And so we had the set list all there. Now I'm, I come out with my guitar. We got the get, roadies with the flashlights leading us up there. It was the most exciting thing because – you know, I, I'm literally, I'm, I'm, I'm a club musician. And I'm finally at a big concert stage and there's thousands of people and I'm so excited. And we, the song starts, right? It goes, bum, bum, hey, 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 hey. Yeah. And I'm, I'm supposed to play it on keyboards and I'm so nervous. I play it on guitar. Oh no. And the whole band, they're looking at me, but it was the same chords. I played <laughs> D, yeah. E, yeah. you know, it was the right chords and all. Everybody looked at me and I'm like, uh oh, what? wrong and I'm thinking, I played I played the right chords, but the, I was for, for that was one time I look back on my career and go, man, I was so nervous I played the wrong instrument. That's that's super nervous. I got through the first or second song and the rest of it was like the greatest night. We had all our friends on stage, like nice. the speaker stack. We had Rhodes and our friends. My girlfriend was there and it was just like, ah! but once I got past that, but outside of that, the first time I, I stepped on stage, I, I couldn't wait to play. I was like Ah, I was a drummer. Like, yes, let's go. I love it. We're we're just a couple minutes over the program, but I got two last questions I want to ask for you for two, uh, for to sure. wrap this up. But one of them will actually tie in very nicely with the nerves, and I want to end it with two photography questions, uh, you know, related because obviously, yeah, uh, that's why I wanted you here, especially. But we wanted to work in some music as well too, uh, and I think we did a really good job with the music portion, which was great. But the nerves, okay? So we you've dealt with it with the musicians uh, as a musician. I've dealt with it as you know stage fright and things like that. How do you take the stage fright for a new photographer? He gets to the new gig, whether it's his first, his or her new uh, first wedding, or just our first, maybe it's a, a birthday shoot, and you show up to the gig and they're nervous. What advice can you give to that person to get yourself under control and get some shots? Well, here's the thing. I, I still get nervous for everything every time I do a shoot, even if I'm the client. Okay. Because if I'm the client, let's say, because I have a shoot next Tuesday, right, for one of my books. Well, I'm paying an assistant, I'm paying the model, I'm paying hair, I'm paying makeup, it better work. Mm -hmm. It better look good, I better get the results, I'm on a deadline for this book. Every, so there's always an investment, whether someone's paying you or you're paying or whatever. If I go to do a client work, because I still do here and there client work, and I also spent the last year shooting for a uh, news wire service, mm -hmm. so I shoot all the NFL games. Uh, I, sh I live in the Tampa Bay area of Florida, shoot all the ta Tampa Bay Buccaneers games, and then I also pick up games for like the Atlanta Falcons and some other teams. And so I'm on a tight deadline. I get Every time I step on the field, I'm nervous. Every time I shoot a client gig, I'm nervous. Every time I step on stage to do that keynote, I'm nervous. Every time I step on stage to play the – I just played drums at a gig here uh, six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm nervous when I do that. And so every time, no matter what I'm doing, I have that I – I call it nervous energy or nervous excitement. I've never found anything that makes it go away other than success. Good. It's like you, you just have to start. Like everybody has to start someplace. And I always tell people like that want to write an article, let's say I hire a writer, you know, they've never written before and they think, you know, I think I could do this. I want to try writing a, a review. Well, the first thing that people do when they start to write and they're not professional writers is they try to put on a thinking cap and go, what would a writer say? I'm going yeah. to use words I don't normally use. You know, it's like, just start writing, mm -hmm. just start writing, write like yourself. You can always come back and fix it. So that's what I try to do. When you're shooting a wedding and it's your first one, just start shooting. Mm -hmm. If you're shooting the bride getting ready, which is traditionally, by the way, at a wedding, the first thing you wind up doing, you're in the make ready room or the hotel room or wherever, and the bride and the bridesmaids are around, just start shooting. You know what will make you calm down? Taking photos. Yeah. And then when you finally when you finally see a good shot, it all just goes away. Yeah, it's like oh. it, it's if you're if you're a comedian, you need a good laugh. Mm-hmm. If you're a musician, you need to nail that last note of the solo. And if you're a wedding photographer, you, you, you got to see that you got it. Whatever it is, you got to be like, okay, I got this. You don't get to there. You don't get to there. Mm -hmm. You don't get to any of those things until you do it. Just go in and start shooting. You'll get past the nerves. But if you wait around or you overthink it and you're like, I just want everything to be perfect. You're going to, you're going to think yourself into a, like a spin. Like if I sit down at the drums with the guitar and I start really thinking about, well, what, what's the first note of that word? Like, oh my gosh, what, what um, is the seventh fret? You'll freak yourself out and mess up. Just slide and go. Just go play. Yep. Just go shoot. 
You just just do it and jump into it. And when you have success, it'll then all of a sudden it's like it's, it's almost like a whoosh. Like whoosh. Mm-hmm. you're a stand-up comedian, you get the first laugh. Whoosh. It all just goes away. Yeah, you you got to get to that. I love that analogy, and I'll just say one thing very quickly. I I'm the same way. With, I'm nervous at everything I do to a, to a small point, and I think the day when you lose the nervous, and this is my opinion. I'm not saying it's right, but I think the day that you lose any nervousness whatsoever is a day that you're no longer grounded. So with the band, no matter what, like even back when I retired, um, the first couple songs were always like, oh, 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 you're shaking a little bit, and then you're into it. It's cool. Even when I show up to a photo shoot now or a video shoot, I'm a little nervous, cause, but I know. It, it, I'll, I'll be texting the wife and she'll say, you know, you're going to do well. And thank you, baby. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm nervous, right? And then you come home like, okay, I did it. It's good. But I think, it, and even when I do this show, believe it or not, when that blue light comes on, I'm like, okay, all right. Is there going to be a train wreck? What's going on? And at the end of the night, I high five the wife and, and it's good. But nerves are a good thing to have because it's letting you know that you're human. You're, there's room for error. Um, but you said- You're alive. Just, just go, Yeah, you're alive. Just go succeed. The last question I have for you, and this, and we're going to tell you're going to tell people at the end of this, uh, we've got a couple of prizes what we're going to give away as well too. So we'll tell you how you can win those yeah, in a moment. Yeah, absolutely. But you have the, I think you're approaching the tenth, or you're on your tenth anniversary of the Scott Kelby International Photo Walk. Tell people what that's about. I think this is very, very cool, um, and how people can participate in them. Oh, great! So a photo walk is is literally just a social event. You don't learn anything. You basically, you meet as a group and usually in a downtown location, right? So you meet in like maybe downtown Toronto or wherever. And you walk around for two hours as a group taking pictures. It literally, all 50 of you move through the streets and you take pictures with people from your local area. Uh, it usually ends at a bar or a restaurant and you have a meal or a drink and then it's done. Now, after that, you can... Uh, enter contests and there's just thousands and thousands of dollars worth of prizes our sponsors canon so they give away all kinds of cool cameras there's sponsors there's prizes for for kids i mean contests for kids where they win two thousand dollars worth of camera gear nice. there's uh there's prizes for the best video taken on the photo walk there's all these gift prizes but it's all kinds of canons like the major prize in each category mm-hmm. but then all these other people have up with camera bags and gift cards to B&H and just on and on and on. So, uh, but the whole thing is designed to basically help you meet new other photographers in your local area. It is really, it's for fun. It's to meet other people. It's to have a great time. And people go, really? It's just, you walk around for a couple of, that's it. <laughs> when you do one, people fall in love with them. I'll bet. It's over already. It really, you have this togetherness in this we're all in this together and then we have like a a social mission besides it the social mission is to support what i talked about earlier that orphanage in kenya so we raise about twenty five thousand dollars a year nice Uh, people give one dollar like when they sign up they don't have to it's Mm -hmm. optional but they give us a one dollar well we get like thirty something thousand people a year so we wind up with you know twenty five thousand dollars or so to give to the orphanage and then we sell t-shirts and 100% of the proceeds from the T-shirts also go to the orphanage. So you're getting to meet new people. You're getting to have fun. Learn. You're going to go to a restaurant maybe you've never been before. You're going to see your city in a new way. You will learn things, not because someone's teaching you, but because you're forced to go shoot yeah. on a path you didn't choose for two hours. And at the end of the day, you're helping feed and clothe and care for and educate 51 orphans. It's like, it's all good. It's just everything good, good, good. And it's free. It doesn't cost anything for anybody. The sponsors have picked up all the costs. Wow. And uh, this is our 10th year of doing it. And you, anybody can join in a city near them. Just go to worldwidephotowalk.com. Type in the name of your city. There's, I think, about 600 walks already around the world. We'll, have, we'll be over 1,000 by the end. And the official date of the walk is Saturday. October 7th. Fantastic. That's so, coming soon. I should I should see it. if I can make that happen in Toronto. That would be beautiful. I'll guarantee you there's already probably a walk in Toronto, so all you have to do is sign up for your local one. But if there isn't, then you should lead a walk. Do you know why? Why is that? Because you're a confident photographer. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> no, you're that's a pressure. confident photographer. Okay. You I, could so lead a walk. I wouldn't mind being the guy 15 people back in the walk, but we'll see. Maybe maybe we'll see what happened in 10 years from now. No, I, I definitely want to look into it, though. That's fantastic. And you're looking, you are seeing your city uh, through the lens, you know, and you're framing things as you're not, you know, you don't see things until you're seeing it through the, through the camera. 
Yeah, you drive by them all day long, but yep. you've never sat Ignore and looked it. at a sign or looked at a doorway or these different angles. And, and people go, I've heard people say, I drive by this every day. I never thought to stop and shoot it. So yeah. it's a lot of fun. It's, it's one of those things that is shockingly fun. Like it sounds like it's going to be okay. And then you do it and you fall in love with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for telling us about the photo walk as well, too. And I, I have to give a of big course. thanks. And this is, I, I'm going to thank all the people that watch this show. Um, I'm going to, for I, what I'm trying to say is you're very influential to the show, what it is today. Number one, uh, my photography that I've got a passion for. Um, there's a very select few people, and you're on the top of that list for the inspiration that you've given me. Um, got into Photoshop and obviously Lightroom. I, I feel I'm fairly gifted in Lightroom because of what I've learned uh, yeah. through you. You put a lot of tips out there for free. Obviously, you have membership courses, which uh, uh, which is fantastic, but you're not afraid to say, here, here's some free tips. You've been posting uh, photography tips all week long on Facebook. Phenomenal stuff. So just a huge, huge, huge thank you for the inspiration, and I want more people to find out more about you. Of course. And down in the description below, I've got links to every profile that you have. Facebook, Twitter, Kelby One. Um, everything. Oh, you're a good man. Everything. Thank you. So guys, have a look, guys and girls, have a look at the links down below. And uh, we're going to give something away tonight. We're going to do something a little different as we wrap up the show here. There's been, uh, we're going to keep continuing giving away prizes away on the show very often. Um, but a couple times where we would have a trivia question, someone would say, okay, the answer is such. Two people would answer at the same time in different time zones and different things. There could be milliseconds of differences. And, and, and sometimes it's actually, you don't even know who's first. You just have to go to the first person you see on the chat. So I want to make it fair. We're going to have two prizes tonight. So when this video, when this episode's over, it's going to take probably about a half an hour for it to uh, be available on YouTube to watch back. And you're able to comment at that point. Just comment uh, down down below. Give it, a, give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't. I'd really appreciate that. Give it a thumbs up. And tell tell us uh, in the comments what you thought was a cool takeaway from this this week's episode. Maybe it was something about photography. Maybe it was Scott's passion for music. Maybe it was my mustache. I don't know what it is. Um, just definitely, it's your it's your mustache. <laughs> that was it for me. That was all right. But just say what you, what was your takeaway? And I know it's not gonna be the mustache. But what was your takeaway? And I like I like to see what um, it might help me improve the show as well too. Um, and just uh, uh, leave that comment down below. So Scott's gonna tell us what he's gonna give away for a prize. So um, I have this book series called the Digital Photography Book Series. It's five different books. And so after the five books were written, I went back and cherry picked the best stuff from all five books and put it in a best of. So it's kind of like a best of album. <laughs> so it's called the best of the Digital Photography Book Series. And I've got two copies of that, but I'm also going to slide in the book a few of the grid guitar picks. Love them. So from my show that we do live every Wednesday, uh, one of our, our viewers actually made us a box of grid picks. And so we've been giving some away as prizes, and I'll I'll make sure you get a grid pick in your book, and I'll sign them as well. Nice. Perfect. Great. So what I'll do is we're going to run that. I'll run that until next week. Next Friday, I've got uh, Derek. And this is a show you want to check out. Derek Sherinian's coming on. Ex uh, Dream Theater with Sons of Apollo. He's like the Eddie Van Halen on keyboards. You should Ooh. see him play. Absolutely stupid. But anyways, he's coming on the show on Friday. So Friday night, I will announce, uh, I'll pick two random win winners and I draw them randomly. It won't be on the nature of the comment. So you can say, Eric, I love you. And I'm not going to pick you because of that. It's going to be all random. And then I'll send the details off to Scott and then uh, he'll get those out to you. If that sounds good to you, Scott. Perfect. Perfect. Fantastic. Well, listen, everybody, uh, Scott, being you the first time on the show here, what I always say to the fans is I like to try to be uh, myself along with the guest, you yourself tonight. I like to be the warm-up band. We're, our, we're the warm-up band for the weekend, so we hope we warmed up your weekend for you. And uh, now it's time for the main act. It's the weekend. We hope you have a great time. Scott, I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air. And thank you, everybody, uh, for another uh, fantastic show. You make this thing happen each week, and, uh, and I love you for it. So we will see you next week and probably be some live broadcast in between. So get to those comments as soon as this video is available. I'm going to turn it over to the little man. He's going to tell us what his name is and he's playing a $25,000 US uh, one of 300 EVH Frankensteins and we'll see you real soon. Cheers everybody. See you soon. Hey, my name is Eric and I'm playing the Frankenstrat guitar. Video production services provided by Design 39 Media. Visit Design39Media.com for all your website, photography and video production needs.